as you can hear there, we'll also be recording the session to share with all our partners, associates, and friends who cannot join us in the conversation today. So please do enjoy. And with that, over to Lana and Chris. Thanks, John. So it falls to me just to open proceedings. So a warm welcome to everybody. Thank you all for taking the time in your morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world and amongst your busy schedules to join us today. And thanks also for to Watson University in India for being the, the hosts of today's session. We're really excited to be having this courageous conversation today hosted from India. So the format for Courageous Conversations is basically 90 minutes broken into thirds. So the first third, we have invited conversation starters to, to have a conversation between them about the topic that, that we think is in some way at the cutting edge of sustainability for the future. So we'll do that for about half an hour and then we'll break out into breakout rooms where you can have a more intimate discussion with a smaller group of people about the topic, which again we'll do for about half an hour. And then the, the last third, we'll come back together as a whole group and just hear any reflections from the small groups or any questions back to the panel. And that the plenary session at the end, my colleague Lana will facilitate, and I'll hold the the opening third. Lana, do you just want to say hi so everyone can see who you are, where you are? Hi, everyone. It's nice to see familiar faces and excited to get into this courageous conversation with you all. Thank you. So our three invited speakers. Our topic for today is inspirations from the global south. Now, in thinking about our com courageous conversations within the GRLI, we, we became conscious that one of the consequences of the history of the world that we now live in is that some voices are centered more than other voices within the dialogue. And we wanted to offer an opportunity to to balance that out a little bit by centering voices from the global south to see what a perspective on global responsibility looks like from the global south what the commonalities are what maybe the differences are how the challenges are different and so on in different parts of the world so the way we'd like to do that is by passing the floor over to our three invited conversation starters and they are Dr. Kakoli Sen from Watson in India. Owen Skay, director of the business school at Rhodes in South Africa. And, and thirdly, Abdul Baki Ahmed, who's vice president of Oikos International. And Oikos is the student movement for sustainability. And Abdul Baki is based in Kano in Nigeria. So there are our three invited speakers. I, I wonder, is it possible technically to spotlight the three of them? I'm looking at somebody from the Watson team. We'll see if we can do that as we go. But failing that, I'll just start the conversation off. When Lana and I were thinking about structuring this conversation, we wanted to make it a kind of a strength-based approach so that we were looking at what is working well from the position of the global south so my first question to to the panel is just to if you could share for everybody something that is going well for you around the topic of global sustainability and responsible leadership at the moment so maybe something that you're feeling particularly proud of something that gives you some great satisfaction in your life. So I'm wondering who would like to start? As the host, maybe, Kokoli, do you want to kick us off? Surely. Thank you so much, Chris, and uh, for organizing this. And 
welcome to all the the panelists as well as the guests and uh, the viewers and participants who are on this panel this is an extremely important area of work for us at Voxen. And uh, when you ask about what is going well with us, ERS happens to be one of the five pillars of the Voxen University. And there is a lot of work happening in that area. And because it is a key area of our work and vision, we are able to come up with a lot of thoughts and ideas and initiatives around global sustainability, starting locally at the university campus. And we are also extremely happy that it is not us who are leading it. It is our students who are conceptualizing it, applying it, practicing it. And that, I think, is going to hold or create a very deep impact in their lives so that when they go out of the university, they are able to take it with them and not just take it, practice it themselves. They should, they would be able to spread the awareness within their immediate and the larger community. So for us, it is one of the main growth areas, one of the main responsibility areas and which we are practicing through our own students. So that is working very well with us and uh, that we are extremely proud of. Thank mm, you. Great, thank you. That kind of brings you in then, Abdul Baki, from the kind of student perspective. It sounds like what's going on at Watson is putting students in, in the forefront. How does it look from an Oikos perspective? Thank you so much, Chris, and uh, thank you everyone for joining today. My name is Abdul Baki Ahmed, and I'm joining from Gombe State, northeastern part of Nigeria. Yeah, it's yeah a bit tense, you know, here yeah, because we're having elections. I mean, our presidential elections in the next three days. So, yeah, it's a bit tense, and I think I'm a bit tense too. Yeah, so I'm talking about responsibility, for sustainability, leadership, especially in the perspective of a student. I will give you the perspective of the student from the global south because Chris, you mentioned something which I think is very important, how history shaped the world in such a way that uh, so many times the voices we hear are from a particular place and so many times you find out like a particular place doesn't have that representation of their voices. So even in International, I think it's more of a global north so I would like to restrict myself to the Global South because of the conversation. Yeah, in our own case here, I think wonderful things are happening. Students like me are taking initiative and actually no longer seeing challenges as problems. Let me put it this way. They see challenges as opportunities. So many times business opportunities, so many times opportunities for them to start, say, an NGO to give people, like, a, let me say, to solve a particular problem. Last year, I was privileged to be selected for a program of the United States Department of State, which is Young Africa Leaders Initiative. Now, this program is divided into three tracks. There is business and entrepreneurship, there is civic engagements, and then there is public management. So I went to Ghana, which is a country in West Africa too, for the program. And when I was there, one thing I observed, I was actually part of a business and entrepreneurship track. So what I observed from both the three tracks of our program is actually how young people, students from different parts of Africa, wake up to the challenges of their societies, to actually forge solutions, to bring forth solutions to the problems of this place. And so many times solutions which are created with Africa in mind, with, for example, Nigeria in mind, with the people of Nigeria, of Africa in mind. So I think that is something which is really going well. And I think an extension of that is how they are no longer um, 
we are no longer because I'm also a young person, yeah. So we are no longer looking at Nigeria, for example, Ghana, Burkina Faso, or Africa as the only place that we can actually get an opportunity of bringing our ideas into reality. So you can have a startup and you can see a person looking out to say an organization in the United States, which is having a business accelerator program to go there and actually ferment those ideas, try to bring them to reality. And I think wonderful things are happening. Now in Nigeria, we have a company, Flutter Wave. It is a unicorn now, a startup. So I think wonderful things are happening. People are waking up to solve challenges. They are seeing challenges as opportunities. Yes. Great. Thank you. Something about student empowerment, something about NGOs, social entrepreneurship. These seems to be emerging themes. Owen, how does it look for you? What's bubbling? Thank you, Chris, and thank you, fellow panelists and everybody else in the GRI community. Chris, you did ask us to say, tell everybody about something you're proud of. So I'm going to brag just a little bit, if you don't mind. But I'm pleased to say that there's an entity in South Africa called PRMR Africa, and they do national surveys. And last year, we were recognized in a survey on corporate care in for the ESG initiatives, the highest rated in the category. For a very small business school, we're very proud of that. But I think the reason that I told you is that this isn't something that we had developed like the year before. We go all the way back to 2004, where my predecessor was visionary enough to see the importance of sustainability and responsible leadership and ethical leadership. And at the time, when we raised why our focus was on this, some people were quite skeptical about it. That they thought it was a fad. They thought that eventually if other bigger business schools got involved, we'd be sort of swallowed up. So I think the message for me out of that is that one has to be authentic about this. And if you're really going to, really going to do it, you have to do it. You've got to walk the talk. And I also draw a little bit from Tom Peters, his book, The Excellence Dividend, where he really highlights execution. And it's not just about formulation, implementation. Often students ask me, why are we also talking about execution now? And the reason for that, I think, is as perhaps we, we know, we don't know as well as we might, is that we can formulate something, talk about implementing it, but when you we actually need to execute it. And the sporting analogy around that is quite good because you don't, you can implement your game plan, but unless the players execute the scoring of the goal, you're not going to come up with the intended outcome. So I think it's really about ensuring that you implement and execute. And so it's been a long journey. I also, myself, sometimes ponder why in many respects would you do that? And I think it's perhaps context specific. In a very small business school in an impoverished part of South Africa in the rural Eastern Cape, where we very stark inequality and inequity in our society. And unless business schools really make a contribution, then I think, again, we really not in tune with what we need to do. So it is an authentic commitment. Through that, though, we have challenges around managing expectations, what we can realistically do and what we can't do. How do we maintain our focus on our academic endeavor, whereas often we we get called into a whole lot of societal initiatives. And that ranges from assisting NGOs and just briefly share with you a couple of initiatives that we are involved in. We have, for one group of students, we have something called Biz Support, and there they specifically have to work in the community and apply business principles aligned to the SDGs. And there have been some remarkable success stories around that. And often what the students find is, in fact, that they learn more than then the beneficiaries of what it is that we're doing. So it teaches them all about humility, about understanding needs and wants, and really being sure that you go there with respect 
you really understand first and you get invited in before you start imposing your will. The other one is in partnership with, with the university in the US where we are working with, with cooperatives. And again, there's going to be cross-fertilization because the global South really appreciate the fact that you're putting the spotlight on us. But at the same time, we need to have knowledge transfer. We really have constraints in the global South in relation to that. So I think the idea is that we partner with the global North um, and they're really willing to share their knowledge. And I think the reciprocal relationship is that we are able to demonstrate in an authentic way, ways that we can really make a difference because ultimately we're all on one planet and we can't have things being skewed to such an extent that as you yourself correctly said, Chris said that people are left out. So that's been interesting. And in conclusion, just in the tech space, tech, the fourth industrial revolution and artificial intelligence and all of that is really important. But what we've also found is that in the youth-led cooperatives, they're more willing to embrace technology, whereas the older generation, they have some reservations about that. Uh, and so I think what we've learned from that is that there's no one size fits all, that technology can certainly help a lot, but it's not the panacea for everything. And sometimes it just comes back to, to really understanding core business principles around, <clears throat> around customer needs and wants and then focusing on creating a virtuous circle. So let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you. I'm hearing something about one of the things I'm hearing. One of the things I'm hearing is about the kind of the sense of responsibility of a business school or an, an educational institution to the kind of, to the community in which it is living and embedded. And I wonder, Kakoli, if you have something to contribute on that, because I know you're doing a lot in that kind of field. Surely. Thanks, Chris. So when I said that we are involving students who are leading it from the front, I have loads to share in that context. By the location where we are, Chris, we are on, we are in a location where we are surrounded by a lot of villages. So we have reached out to more than five, six villages where we are doing a complete planning of the people who are living there. These are small little villages which do not have enough resources perhaps reaching them. So whether it is in terms of school or whether it in terms of the, um, the financial awareness, whether it is in terms of the business acumen, or medical facilities, they probably could do with a lot more. So our students and our faculty members, some of us, we kind of develop our plans and we try and reach out to them. And we are also fortunate because we have seven different schools, which involves in the university, which involves business, art and design, architecture, law, technology, and so on, humanities, science, and so on. So what happens is because we have several schools in the university, it is possible for us to put together a complete project, which may require inputs, some inputs from the design school, from a design perspective, something from the business school, something from the technology school and or, or from the legal background. So all of us come together and we try and give the entire plan of action for, we design a plan of action for a village and we continuously be there. We do not do sporadic activities. Okay, one-off activity there. We look at it, we are in touch. There is a concept called Sarpanch, which is a self-governing body in the, or a panchayat, which is self-governing body in the, in every rural setup in India. So where they self-govern. So we, we are in touch with them and we with them together with them, we map out that what is there available in the village, what are the things that they would need from us, what are we capable of, and we put those things together. 
whether it is in terms of their awareness, whether it, in, it is in terms of their awareness in the field of health, as well as legal aid, as well as financial literacy, or training them for some kind of skilling. So we look at all of those requirements and then we reach out to them. Additionally, we involve them into different programs that we do or different festivals that we celebrate we give them the exposure of bringing them to the university and showing them what happens in the university, what is it that they could aspire for, what else we could do for them, and what is the world looking like out there for them. We keep a very close contact with them and uh, kind of work for them in the long run. So it is not as if we just go and give them certain things, which we do also from time to time. Let's say there is a school which needs a particular kind of equipment or a filter or some kind of a projector or some stationery or something from time to time. We do help them with that. But more than that, we and that anyone can do more than that. What we try to do is we try to give them we try to empower them with something. So if we are we are want if we, if there is a if there is a legal help that they require so we create a legal cell or a legal aid workshop where they can come and ask any questions or if there is anything related to how do they plan their retirement or how do they grow their business or how do they what kind of education can their kids go for in higher education so we do different kinds of these workshops where we empower them rather than telling them what we, they should be doing. We give them the scope, we give them the exposure, and then we leave them to develop their own or take on take their own decisions. And it's been working very well. We are also able to map their vision of what they would like to do going forward. Come to us and uh, we constantly we keep going so there are enough student bodies and faculty bodies which are constantly in touch with them depending on their skills and expertise and that's how we are taking the community together with us and uh, our students are extremely involved in this and by way of doing this because they are into a lot of events they are also doing NGO internships with NGO I think Abdul Ahmed talked about it so in our undergraduate program there is a compulsory minimum two weeks of internship, NGO internship that they need to do to be able to understand what is an NGO, how does it contribute to the society, what, how do we make NGOs more, more sustainable. That is how it is not just in terms of activities, it is also embedded in the curriculum and uh, that's how we are trying to make it not something like an add-on, it is completely entrenched into the curriculum and the different kinds of activities that there are students too. Thank, Thank you. you. Amazing. So much richness in, in that about uh, everything that's going on. Abdul Baki, I'm, I, part of what was going on for me when I was listening to that was I was wondering about kind of leadership within that kind of a context and thinking about the future and just wondering as a, as a younger person thinking about what what's coming in the future and whether you have reflections on the kind of leadership that we might need in this kind of transition at the moment or and if you have any reflections on how well your education equipped you for that leadership that might be interesting too i don't know if you have some reflections on that yeah thank you so much chris i think Regarding how much my education is preparing me for that very leadership, I would not say it is doing much, honestly. And that's why I talked about, about the initiative which young people are taking. It's really interesting because you'll find out it's something autodidactic. They are doing it for themselves. They are trying to learn outside their own curriculums and not only learning, trying to put it into practice through the businesses they are starting. And uh, maybe sometimes, you know, the civic engagements they, they get into. So I think yeah, that's, that's one part where our international is playing a very good role. For example, our chapter here in Kano, we have a chapter in Kano because uh, Kano, we are actually working right now with Bio University Kano to introduce sustainability as part of courses like economics and engineering 
uh, which I think will be really great because sustainability, um, when I look at the leadership of the future you're talking about, I think is really key. Sustainability is at the center of that leadership. But beyond that, I think for me, the leadership I am actually looking forward to, or which I think would be the leadership of the future is a leadership which is emerging from within. Somebody can be a leader without being technically or a leader. We all need to be leaders in and of ourselves. We all need to know how to navigate out of the turbulence of our century. Now we say we are living in, in a time that is called VUCA world, which is a volatile, uncertain, ambiguous. And so we really need to have that very leadership to navigate out of that very volatility out of that uncertainty and ambiguity. And I think that's really important. Understanding our being, who are we? What are our strengths? What are our weaknesses? And I think looking at how young people, especially in Nigeria, where I am from, are actually, as I said, learning by themselves and trying to actualize those very things. I think it is something which is happening. And that's why I really appreciate the connectivity of the world. It's a borderless world. As I said, people are looking at opportunities, not only in Nigeria or Africa, they are looking at opportunities everywhere. And I think it's really working, yeah. Thank you. I love that notion of if you're not getting it from your education, you'll just do it yourself. <laughs> Great. I think we're gonna to move to the breakout groups soon, but I just wonder whether you have a, a kind of a last reflection on leadership either from the point of view of what you feel is being called of you as a leader in the, at the moment or what you feel your students are, are needing as they're heading out into the world? Well, thanks, Chris. I just wanted two points I want to just pick up from mm -hmm. what Vicoli said. Oh, okay, yeah. Mark, and that is that you know, integration is incredibly important. And I think that we're seeing that I think there's a common message from all three of us here. And I think that we're going to see that happening more and more. So whether we talk about interdisciplinary trans, so on and so forth, that's really important. I also particularly liked uh, Abdul Baki's focus on didactic, because one of the debates that we constantly have is around skills and knowledge. You know, and the relevance of us within the context where we are. So you know, on the one hand, we can try to, to develop skills, but then are we having the sort of knowledge transfer, knowledge context that needs to be understood. And so in, in, in the quest to have things happen in the short term, you may compromise the long term. And that's where we finding that, that we, it's not easy to think about this in terms of what is the role of a business school where we are. And at times we think that we are straight jacketed by the kinds of bureaucracy in terms of modeling a curriculum and how we do that and what is really our, our purpose at the end of the day, which of course talks about our leadership. So I think one of the things is that we are a loosely coupled system. We really like the theory around that where often people have to make up the rules as they go along. Not always comfortable in the context of, of higher education, but that in fact highlights the importance of leadership even more, is that you can't abdicate this. But I think too, that we must acknowledge that there's a trust deficit. The, if you really ask people and students who are leaders that one really aspires to, I think what we're finding more and more is that people are becoming very cynical about people that wield enormous influence and really what seems to be apparent to many people in terms of what needs to be done in order to put us where we need to be and whether you're making the business or moral case. We have to think really more about what our role is in, in that point of view. Yeah, it's, it's challenging, but that's why we're here. You know, I think we're up for that. And the more we can collaborate around that, hopefully the quicker we can come up with the solutions that we need to have. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you to all three of you. That's been incredibly rich, I think, as a starting point.
for discussions. I, I'm hearing a number of themes which people may want to pick up in the breakout rooms. Of course, what happens in the breakout rooms is entirely up to you and the th things that are uppermost for you. Some of the things I heard were about what is the responsibility of a business school as an institution within its wider community, something about the role of leadership from within and where that comes from and what that means in a volatile world, something about centering voices that don't get heard and something about empowering and working with and developing entrepreneurship, social entrepreneurship within kind of those sectors of communities that don't often get heard. So those might be some themes that you'd want to pick up in, in breakout groups. Now I've, I've created groups and it looks like they should be pretty mixed in terms of my guesses of where people are from. So geographically, you should, it looks like you should get quite a good mix, which I I think might help the discussion. So I'm going to open the rooms. We'll have about 25 minutes in the breakout rooms, and that will then bring us back for about half an hour. Lana will convene for the wider plenary discussion. So I'll open the rooms now. Good luck and enjoy yourselves. Mm, thank you. Thank you for bringing in the voices of how can we decenter perspectives? How can we invite getting into these conversations and invite lived experiences, especially from the youth who are also bringing in quite a lot of wisdom? And I guess this is also a bit of that reframing, right? Of when we think of education as the teachers as the only source of learning, now we're really reframing it as just not just the the teacher but also the students are a wealth of experience and a wealth of wisdom that they are bringing in the classrooms or in the educational spaces in in our group we've had quite a fascinating conversation and i would like to invite and you know, either leticia john kathleen abdulbaki of and i don't know if Ragav is still here in terms of yeah what came up for you that we can share with the others. I know there's really a bit of that emphasis on expanding not just the perspective from the self, but also to the environment as well, and how we can include that in our in our conversations. So Leticia, would you want to add some voices in from our group? Oh no, I'm happy to hand over to Kathleen or John or Gulbaki to share some of those things. Thanks very much. I've spoken enough. Very clever. I'll just add one thing that I think has been given some color from Carol's examples and Miriam's examples. John brought up the idea of relational innovation, because we need the connects, yet we seem to always revert to thinking about technological connectedness. And John, you can jump in and clarify whatever I paraphrase. But the idea of a reframe to relational innovation instead of technological innovation is very intriguing. And I think what you've just described about the voices of the students and the other kinds of activities for bringing connection, it's a new way, it's innovative, but the underlying purpose is really connection. So that's one thing we talked about was relational innovation. I added one other comment. I'm a big fan now of positive deviance and not in the sense of best practices, but in the sense of the solution comes from within. So you've described some good context. I was searching for examples actually of the relational innovation, but that sort of the solution from within like here today. 
So that was my paraphrase of some of the things we talked about. And I don't know how to pronounce it, but Lana shared a really beautiful Mayan form of Ubuntu. You are my other me. I think that's beautiful too. So we also really emphasize on how this strengths-based approach of lifting up what's currently working well is very important since our society is very much cultured around the deficit model, which looks at, okay, what are, they, what are people lacking? What do they need? So the salutogenic versus pathogenic approach is very much needed because when we approach things more from a strengths base, uh, we're asking the question of what's currently going well rather than looking at what's not going, what's not going. How about from the other group? Curious to know, Owen. Yeah. Well, thanks, Lana. And Clegg can, uh, can come and after me if they like. So we all set up Jeet and uh, Arian, but we ended up having more of a trialogue, uh, which is really interesting because I think what we also found is that there's a lot of similarities and the common denominator. Voices, elevating voices, social purpose, governance, the trust deficit, which is really a global phenomenon. How we resolve it, there may be different ways as to how we get there. Expectations, and certainly the belief that the youth, without, and as I think that some of us might disagree with you a little bit, that, that the wiser generation are not past their sell by date. I guess it's just a question of how we how we draw on the wisdom, the wisdom, but at the same time, the exuberance of the youth and and really the incredible ideas and drive and passion that they've got. And that talks to the whole leadership dynamic. And Claire, perhaps I let me hand over to you. I don't want to steal your words there, but it's around the leadership within. Perhaps you want to just reflect a little bit on that. And then Sally, I, and I thought what was really profound for me in terms of the discussion that you had was around, around the governance aspect, inclusive mm. part of it. Maybe you just want to embellish a round of what I've said, if you're happy with mm. that. Thank you, Owen. Unfortunately, Sally's had to go. So I, I don't know if, if that, if you'd like to just expand a, a little on the governance conversation that you would on behalf of Sally because she's not here I don't know if that makes if that's helpful but and then I'm happy to come in yeah thanks you know what we had a good discussion there around so Sally's involved in housing government housing and how one puts social justice at the forefront of what needs to be done and and often people are, are needing housing and don't have the financial means to do that. But that doesn't mean that you just can tell them what to do or you must do this or do that. It's always, again, around dignity and respect and certainly those models where there's governance and the people that are involved in whatever it is have a say and they made a huge amount of progress in that regard. And I think that's something that we still, as we discussed, we have a long way to go in relation to our own context. And that was where Claire came in around, again, the importance of governance. And of course, it's easier said than done, but that's where business schools have a really profound role to play in ensuring that whatever it is and however we do it, that we be very clear about expectations in terms of how we teach and research governance. Claire, over to you. Thank you, Owen. Yeah, I can't emphasise enough how much I think good governance is at the heart of so many things. And when it's not there, you only really realise it, it's when it's not there, just how important it is, and then how it's done and so on. 
Yeah, so for me, what I took from the conversation were a number of things. The the absence of tr when trust is when there is a trust deficit, the implications and consequences of that. And then we also talked about the inspirations from the global south, because that's the that's what the conversation is about. And Owen was expanded on some of the things that that him, which had a resonance for Sally and I, which is about when there is leadership with so few resources, when there's an authentic desire to give back. And there is the integration element of it. So I just wanted to expand on that a little bit. So it's integration of disciplines, which we heard so so clearly and beautifully from Watson, but also and also it's the integration of age, of diversity, of ethnicity, of bringing together the wholeness of whatever we happen to be in. And I was really struck by the opening remarks around leadership from within. And then how do we integrate both the inside and the outside, the internal and the external, in order to be able to be as authentic as we possibly can be in the world? Because it's out of that that real whole leadership emerges. So it was a great discussion, and there was much more than that. But that's for me, is the essence of building on what Owen said. I love what you shared, Claire, about bringing the wholeness from within. This is also why the strengths-based approach works very much because we don't see individuals or communities or organizations as parts. Rather, we see them as an intrinsic whole. And it reminds me of an article about how Maslow focused more on the self-actualization rather than what the Blackfoot nations have been aspiring on, that we are actually born self-actualized, right? So that if we come from that framing of self-actualization is not the goal, rather that self-actualization is already within us, then how can that be shared in, in, in how we're doing things? So what you've just emphasized on bringing the wholeness from within is that enough shining a mirror on us and saying, hey, we all have the assets, we all have the wisdom, we all have the capabilities within us. So how can we, yeah, how can we amplify that and show that more? And in our group, one of the things that Leticia also shared was, there's a question now of, okay, now hearing about all these conversations and having all these conversations, the next question is, but how do we then bring it back? How do we move outside of this bubble of the conversations that we're having that's very much provocative and gets us into a space of reflection to how can we move from reflection to action? Mm -hmm. And perhaps I would like to, this is the time to invite our, our speakers to, to just share last words before we wrap up today's co courageous conversations on how can we move then from this space of reflecting on decentering voices, leadership from within, really looking at our strengths and what's already working well, and how do we take that in back in terms of action? I would like to invite Koli. What are your last words? Thank you, Lana. Thank you so much. You've done a brilliant job of so many rooms discussing diverse ideas and opinions and suggestions and bringing them together for all of us. They're very intriguing discussions. So again, a good, very good question. When you're saying that so much of talking, so much of thoughts, how do we integrate them and how do we bring them to an action? Difficult, for sure difficult, because there is just so much to do. However, I feel that if we all make that as make, you know, whatever we are wanting to achieve, and of course, different places, different countries have south, north, east, west, all of us have different kinds of challenges. And also because, so we have challenges at the local level, we have challenges at the global level. So if at the local level, at least we could come, if 
identify what our challenges are. I think Claire talked about resources, limited resources. It could be a lot about, apart from resources, it could be about lack of empowerment, lack of agility, lack of results that are coming may not come in like in a very short time. It may also be short-sightedness of leaders when you are starting out. So I think what we need to do is um, look at the broader picture, the bigger picture in terms of what do we want to achieve and then break them into shorter or smaller or more concrete plans of action. And that will help us see where we are going and be able to achieve it. So I'll just take two more minutes. In my opinion, what we could do is, I think in one of our groups, we were talking about, Anders was there, where he was talking about that bringing the, the history and the technology together, where we did speak about what are the challenges of North and what are the challenges of South. Perhaps that is one ideal area that we are currently not looking into. So if we do want to look up, there is a lot of collaboration happening between North and South. So if that is a priority, then that needs to be defined as such. And then we work backwards in terms of what we want to achieve and then what we need to work around that. Similarly, when we are doing, if I come back, and as I said, every nation may have their own set of challenges and they make that their priority. So for example, the challenges that we face in our country and in our localities, we make that our priority. But as a global level, we could always have an, a fair exchange of ideas in terms of what is a priority for another country and how can we become a resource for them? And for our priorities, how can they become a resource for us? There has to be a sharing that happens across knowledge, across technology, across resources, and so on. And then how are we doing it? So we are looking and we've made this because we know at the local level, we have a lot of our country is a country of kind of haves and have nots. So we are trying to bring those together. We want if we, if we are sure we are certain of that, we want to extend the support and collaboration and cooperation to our immediate community. And if all of us are doing that within our country, I'm sure we'll make a huge change to our environment into immediate ecosystem. So that we have made our priority and we are continuous. That's not just a in priority so much so that it is one of our pillars of development and growth. So for the university and that we are consistently working around it. Because we are working around it and because it is a pillar, that is why we have action plan up for it. And we are working consistently towards it so that we can see, okay, this was the problem. This is what we thought could be solution and let us work on that. And we are able to see the results. So if we can manage ourselves in terms of what should be our immediate short-term goal, what could be our long-term goals, probably we will be, we'll be able to see the results of our initiatives and actions. Thank you, Lana. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kakali. How about you, Owen? last thoughts around how can we bring this into action? So Ilana, is that for me? Yes. So I just broke up the my internet is unstable. Look, it's a tough question. Thank you, Letitia, for asking that question. You can see that, that we have these tough conversations in, the, in our school already, even between ourselves. So the quicker we can extend it outside, even better. I think that one has to also be practical and one has to have a framework. And I, I believe that the SDGs provide a good framework for us to really frame what it is that we're doing. Ultimately, if we're not, if we're not committed to the 17 goals, and we can't do all of them all at once, but I think it's important that it must be very front of mind in terms of how we speak about it, what we do, how we really get everybody who's involved. <clears throat> and then I think in relation to executive education, which is something that business schools are also very involved in. And often that's, 
that in itself is a little bit of a challenge, but also an opportunity because maybe the audience is a little bit more skeptical, maybe they're a little bit more forthright and expressing views about certain things. But certainly one of the things that we've often found in our context is that when we expose our corporate clients to the kind of thinking that we think is important, they acknowledge that uh, they sometimes struggle to implement it within their own organizations. And so we have to really also think about how we can assist them to conceptualize. And I think that's a lot of what Nicole was talking about as well. And what I've lastly, what I've taken away today really is around this continued, you know, we need to continue to have these conversations. Certainly, we cannot just say that the global north has got nothing to teach us. We can, <clears throat> but recently I reviewed a paper and it was made very explicit to me and I, it struck me as a review of a paper that I hadn't really consciously absolutely thought about this before, but pedagogy and pedagogy. And really what I found in there is that the study that had been done again showed that the generational focus that the younger academics are more inclined to the hutagological, whereas the older are more the pedagogical. We've got to revisit our own teaching model. And I think the global south is that perhaps we further down the road in Hutagogy, because at the end of the day, as you said, that knowledge has to come out. And I think we've still got a long way to go to find ways to bring that knowledge out. But you know, listening to Abdul Baki, he, he showed some really good examples of how they're doing that. And I think we can learn from each other within the global south too. So let me stop there. Thanks. Thank you, Owen. And lastly, Abdul Baki, what are your last words and how we can put this back into action? Yeah, thank you so much. For me, I think as a young person from the Global South, I think the key towards bringing all the talks into action is in making young people like the center, let's say the central point of this. And I think we can do this by doing what just talked about, about looking at our models of teaching. Now, we have problems which sometimes are unprecedented and the world is always stable, very uncertain, very volatile, the world we live in today. So I think we need to actually give students or young people the skills that are necessary to help them navigate through these very challenges. Before, usually, when we talk about leadership, we're talking about one person, like one power leader, leading people. That's how we see leadership before. But I think now we see it as, and I think this is a very important, we see it as something which everybody needs in order to navigate out of our problems and challenges. And I think this is very important. For example, in Webos International, where I'm coming from, they have uh, this program, Leap Youth, and uh, the program is about the IDGs, that is Inner Development Goals. Now, these goals are necessary for the realization of the SDGs. So without the Inner Development Goals, it's, it will be very difficult to achieve the SDGs. And we all believe that the SDGs are very key at the center of actually driving the change that we're looking for in all that very responsible leadership. So I believe we will have to do that. And you see this leap youth, we have a module which is about being. So you understand yourself, you understand your strength, you understand your weaknesses. We have something about thinking, thinking, critical thinking. People have to know this, especially young people who are the center of changing these narratives. I think this is really critical and really important. And we should open doors for them to actually execute what they have, give them the place, even from school, as 
Dr. Kakoli talked about having a program where students go for internship with an NGO. And even though it's two weeks, it might be small, but it can do a lot because sometimes all you need to all you need is to see or to have something to just switch you on. And when you are on, you just go and it will be a very wonderful journey for our world and for ourselves. Thank you. Thank you, Abdul Baki. Thank you, everyone, for joining today's call. Chris, I'm bringing it back to you to share what's in the horizon for us in the Courageous Conversations so that they know what's up next. Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm conscious that we're up against time, but just very quickly, if I can share my screen. Yep, here we go. The next. Courageous Conversations are diaried up and we have working type titles for them. So we have themes. And so the dates are there on the screen. Uh, and the three topics that we're looking at for the remainder of the year are decolonization. So the working title, Can We Decolonize the Business School? And the second, secondly, is the kind of the greenwashing kind of issue so is sustainability a scam or is corporate sustainability a scam and then lastly in september degrowth is it a part of the solution or is it a kind of a, a utopian impossibility or maybe a dystopian yeah, <laughs> impossibility so those are the themes and as i think you can see they are quite courageous conversations so we we invite you all to lean into the challenge and to join us for those put them in your diary there is a way john isn't there to, to have those drop into your diary automatically by subscribing to the grle grli diary absolutely so yeah if you go to our website under impact and events and i'll just put the link on the page now you can subscribe using Whichever provider you use, you can subscribe to our pods, cohorts, and conversations calendar, or to our external advocacy and courses calendar, or to our governance meetings calendar. Of course, some of those meetings are specifically for the board or the guardian group, but the majority of our work in terms of pods and conversations is available to everyone who's interested in contributing in a constructive way. And with that, thanks, Chris and Lana, also, and to our courageous starters of today's con conversation, Kakoli and Abdul Baki and Owen. It was wonderful to hear from you, to learn from you, and to engage with everyone on this call in this, in this inquiry. So also from my side, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you indeed. Thank you to everyone for, for joining, and thank you especially to the conversation starters and to Watson for hosting if you have two more minutes while you were in the breakout rooms i was trying to manage people coming in and move people around groups but then i reached for a poetry book and i always love to incorporate a poem if i can into things so this is david white the, who's an anglo irish poet who i kind of love and i just opened the book and it was this one it's called what to remember when waking in that first hardly noticed moment in which you wake, coming back to this life from the other more secret, movable and frighteningly honest world where everything began, there is a small opening into the day that closes the moment you begin your plans. Because what you can plan is too small for you to live. What you can live wholeheartedly will make plans enough for the vitality hidden in your sleep. To become human is to become visible while carrying what is hidden as a gift to others. To remember the other world in this world is to live in your true inheritance. You are not a troubled guest on this earth. You are not an accident amongst other accidents. You were invited from another and greater night than the one from which you have just emerged. How beautiful, Chris, mm. this is just so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. And I you. think it, it maybe talks of that, how to bring everything to action.
and to leave that. from within. So thank Share you very that. much. You thank you all for joining. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, everyone, for joining in this. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye.